All right. Let's go back to Romans 8 this afternoon. And let's consider this phrase in Romans 8, verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, in the context of the Handel's Messiah series that we've been doing, this is actually the second to last um, scripture that's used in Handel's Messiah. And so we've been going through them just because they're very messianic passages, and we started at Christmas time, and, and now it's July, and we're finally <laughs> getting close to the end. And so um, it's been, it's been a, a, a rich study. And last week we talked about the, uh, the victory that Christ won in his death and resurrection, the victory that he won over the grave and over uh, sin, and, and, but really over, over the grave and the confidence that we have in resurrection. And now we come to this question, if God be for us, if God has won the victory, the question is, um, who can be against us? And I think this is, this is wonderful, and especially from Romans 8, because Romans 8, as we've already seen, is very much about the resurrection and about the new bodies that we will receive and our likeness to Christ, which is the desire and goal of God for us. Um, now, we've already seen this. We've, we, we found it in verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good, and that good is found in verse 29, what the good is, to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. So the things, the thing that all things are working towards is toward the conforming of the believers to the image of his Son. Now, there's a lot involved here in this statement because, because Christ conforming us to his image, and that being the only thing, that's his whole, his whole goal, all of his will is wrapped up in that, is, you know, there's a lot of verses previous in this chapter that give us an understanding that all of creation, the new heavens and the new earth, all of that is all waiting for the resurrection of the saints and the new bodies that the saints are given, the, the likeness of Christ of the saints. Because those once that takes place, then the unbelievers are cast into hell. The saints can go on into the new heavens and new earth, and there is a future um, for them. But it's all contingent on them being co- becoming like Christ. This is what all, everything is, is building towards. If you study eschatology, if you study the end times, and you, you, know, you study the, the Antichrist, or you study the abomination of desolation, or whatever you're studying... It's, remember, and keep it in context that it's all about the conforming of us into the image of the Son so that we can go on living with God and praising Him forever in eternity. And none of that, it, all of that is what's God's desire. He wants all to come to repentance and that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. But those who do come to repentance, those are the ones that are going to go into eternity And this is the desire of God. This is what all of the eschatology is about. God could end it all right now and live by himself just fine. (laughs) The the whole drama of history has all been to get to that place where the sons of God are glorified, are like Christ. So when it says this here in verse 29, that's leading up to God before us, who can be against us, as whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to his image. He's saying, in the context of the verse before, all things are working together towards this end goal. This is the goal of God, that we be like Christ. I mean, to see the importance of our Christ-likeness, like this is what it's all about, that we would shine forth the glory of God as Christ does. Christ came as the model man, the man who is better than Adam, the, 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 the good Adam, not the Adam that plunged everyone into sin, but the Adam who rescued uh, all the human race from sin. As, as man, he died for the sins of man. And so then we have this rescuing of man from, uh, by the, the better Adam, by Jesus Christ, and God calls us to be like Christ. Not just in the future, 
in that final future where we'll be perfectly like Christ, but more and more like Christ now. And verse 31, we'll get to that as we walk verse by verse, but when it says, if God be for us, who can be against us? The question is really saying, if God has guaranteed that we're going to be like Christ one day, who can prevent it from happening? Now, this is a great verse when you're dealing with someone who thinks that you, someone can be genuinely saved, can be guaranteed that they're going to be like Christ, and then lose their salvation. Because this verse literally says, how could that possibly be? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who could possibly take away our salvation? Well, the answer is no one. <laughs> if God is securing our salvation, then no one can take it away. If God has predestined us to be conformed to his image, then anyone who does not conform to his image was clearly not predestined to do so. Therefore, they were not saved. They were not actual believers. Now, the problem with that is when we get to the end of our life and we die, it may not be apparent to other people whether or not God was working to conform us to his image on the inside. Because, as we mentioned before, Paul was saying, I am a wretched sinner. Look at me, you know. So the outward appearance doesn't... Not, so we see somebody who's living wrongly, who claims to be a Christian. We should rightly say, we have no confidence that that is actually true based on the way that you're living. But we cannot conclude for certain that they are not a Christian, are not a believer in Christ, um, because it is possible that something more is going on on the inside and that God is working on them, right? But we can generally conclude that if someone is not choosing to live for Christ at all, they're confronted with their sin and they say, I don't care, I want to do this. They don't really care about living for themselves and, and ignoring the, the standards of God and the holiness of God. That we can conclude that it's a really good chance that they never repented, meaning turning from their own life and turning to Christ instead and giving their life to him, we can conclude then that it's very possible and very likely that they didn't ever repent and are not saved. But this passage makes it very clear. If they are saved, they're saved. And that's it. There is no getting out of it. So let's walk through the, the, the logic. This is what uh, theologians have called the golden chain of redemption. The golden chain of redemption. And you can see the chain, um, how each word is linked to the next. For whom he did foreknow, there's the first link in the chain. He also did predestinate, there's the second link, to be conformed to the image of his son, there's the next link. And whom he did predestinate, he also called. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Um, so foreknow, predestined to be conformed, uh, those who predestined are called, those who are called are justified, those who are justified are glorified. So there's the chain. Let's target with each of these words and ask what they mean. Look at verse uh, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. What does this word foreknow mean? And we know what the word predestinate means, right? That means it's predetermined that this is what's going to be the outcome of something, right? It's predestined. To, to be so. But somebody who would take the position that's commonly called Calvinist or Reformed theology is the new phrase that they like to use. Someone who takes that position is going to say that this predestination means that God does not have any conditions by which he chooses his people. He doesn't choose you because you have faith in him. Rather, he chooses you because he just loves you more and then causes you to have faith. Now, a Calvinist might say, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to put it that way. But that's exactly what they mean. Because when they deal with this word for no, they turn it into the word for love. So uh, you say, how, does, how is that possible? Well, let me try to explain it. So the problem a Calvinist has is that when it talks about predestining in the Bible, it also says for no, which means that God predestined people to be conformed to his image, yes. But the ones that he predestined were the ones that he foreknew something about them, meaning there was a condition 
that God had in order to predestine them. He, he had some condition for this whole thing, and it was something he foreknew about those people, right? So the obvious answer, since Romans uh, 9 talks about who, who he chooses and who he doesn't choose, it says, uh, verse 31 of Romans 9, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness, meaning they're not saved. And verse 32, wherefore, because they sought it not by faith. So very clearly, the condition for God's choosing, well, it, it's the faith of people. Uh, the Romans 10 goes on to talk about this condition by which God chooses. It says in verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised it from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So it's very clearly faith that is the condition for salvation. And so when it says, for whom he did foreknow, it seems very obvious that it's saying that God foreknew who would have faith in him, and those people he's since the beginning of time, caused all things to work towards them being made into the image of Christ. Now, that's a powerful statement and is very clearly the context of the passage. But here's how somebody who denies this will take it. They'll say that word for no uh, comes from the word gnosko, um, which is the Greek word from which we get the word Gnostic um, and, and other words, which just talk about knowledge. But they'll say... Mary, in the book of Luke, uses the word gnosko to say, I have not, uh, how can it be that I, I'm going to give birth to the Messiah, she says to the, to the angel, be seeing that I do not know a man, I do not gnosko. Um, now, in the scripture, that word know can refer to an intimate relationship between a husband and a wife, right? Now, so a, a Calvinist will say, this may sound silly, and it it should sound silly because it is silly, that then the word gnosko or the word no means that this is not just a foreknowledge, but for God previously, before the foundation of the world, had an intimate loving relationship with us in a way that he didn't love everyone else. And, for, and so they say that means that who God loved ahead of time, he predestined to be na- made into his image, and then those who he did not love, he predestined to go to hell, is, is the assumption, there, right? There's the what goes without being said in that verse. The problem with this is that that's complete nonsense, right? Mary was saying, I do not know a man. It doesn't mean that she didn't love a man. She very well may have had a very loving relationship with, uh, with Joseph, even though she had not known him. Right? So there was a, something different. There's the, the idea of a, of a physically intimate relationship does not mean that that is love. That's actually sort of just a sort of a product of love. It is not itself love. We know that because we're looking around in our society today. We're seeing a lot of people engaging, engaging in those kind of actions that do not love one another. So it's very clear that, that word does not mean love. In fact, the word itself has a definition, gnosko. It literally just means to discover something uh, about something. Uh, and, and in a relationship setting, a lot of times it's, it's to discover something new that you had not known before about someone, right? Um, which certainly applies when you are um, first married, right? You're discovering something new. <laughs> uh, but it's about the discovery. It's not about the love, right? So the word gnosko literally means uh, get this? No. I mean, fascinating that, that we actually have it right in the Bible. And literally, I don't, I don't think it's going to matter. I don't know of any translation in Scripture that's going to translate this as for love, but a Calvinist needs that to make their point. So what we have here is the beginning of this chain of redemption starts with God's foreknowledge, clearly, of something that is his prerequisite for him to predestine you to salvation. Now, God chose you and predestined you to be made into the image of his son before you had faith in him. But God foreknew that you would have faith. God foreknew that you would repent by faith and become a believer. And so, because of his foreknowledge, he has already set thousands of years before you came into existence everything in motion for you to one day be just like Jesus in heaven. And 
All the things in your life, you know, that affect you, you know, let me just give you an example, right? You're driving down the road, you're, you're, you're getting, you're running out of money because, because <laughs> the gas prices these days, you know, and, and you know what, we're, we're starting to go into darker and darker times in our country. And, and you just start thinking, you know, why would God allow all this to happen? Well, we talked about it in the previous message. All this is working out for our, for our benefit, to make us more like Christ. All of this works God's will. But you realize how much had to happen for all of this to happen? I mean, in order for America to go down, it first had to come up. That was hundreds of years ago when America started. You know? And before that, there was a whole series of events that go all the way back to Adam and Eve that brought us to this point. And you realize that every little tiny thing in your life is the result of something else, the result of something else, the result of something else, the result of something else. So literally everything God's brought in, he started at the beginning of time. He's already predestined it all to happen the way that it's happening. Why? To make you more like Christ. Because he foreknew that you would choose Christ as your Savior. Okay? For whom he foreknew, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. So all of these things are previous. The foreknowing us and the predestination, but then it says that we are called. Now this word called is not the same as the word draw. When Jesus says, well, if I be lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men unto me. That means there's a sort of a drawing, a pulling towards him. And that, of course, is the case. Since Jesus died on the cross, the draw is not to uh, back in the Old Testament, Israel was to point people to the Father, to, to God himself. Now, the church is to point people to Jesus, who is God, but specifically to Jesus, who is the Messiah, Christ, the Son of God. This is our, our, our goal. And Jesus said, as, when he's lifted up on the cross, he draws people to himself. That is to say, like the beginning of Romans, that we all have this instinctive knowledge that we are, through creation, that we are sinners, and that, we, that there is a God. And we have conscience that declares to us that we're a sinner. And because of those two things, we're all in some way drawn to Jesus, whether, whether it's in a uh, way that we're actually presented the gospel or we just know that there must be a gospel out there, we need to start looking for it, right? We all know that we're sinners and that there is a God we have to answer to. And this is the reality. So, we know that we're drawn, every person is drawn to Christ in some way. That's what Jesus said, I'll draw all men unto me. But this does not say whom he foreknew he also predestinated and whom he predestinated he also drew. This says whom he predestinated he also called. Now call, the call here, is just a word that means an invitation. It would be something that you would do. I mean, I suppose you, we could even use this word today. Hey, I called some, so-and-so on the phone and invited them over for dinner, right? Um, but to, to, the, to the first century mindset, this call, this invitation would be, you would be called to come to someone's house uh, to dinner um, or, or, or to, to an, an event. But usually it would be a dinner or more likely it would be something like a wedding feast. You would be called to the wedding feast. Meaning you had an invitation. You had the right to be there. And it says here, all the other stuff is previous. Like, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of Christ. And those who he predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ have the right to be like Christ. He's given them the invitation. He's given them the right to be like Christ. Now, just imagine that we have the right to be there in heaven, in, in the new heavens and new earth. We have an invitation. We have, we have a pass. Why? Because our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And when we get there, us dirty, rotten sinners, because he foreknew us and predestined that we be made into the image of God, we have an invitation slip that says, I can go in. That's amazing. It, it seems impossible, but that's all the work that Christ did when he died and rose from the dead. So last week when we talked about how he's won the victory over the grave, 
this is directly connected to what we're looking at today. So whom he predestinated, he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. Now obviously this has to be, has to be taking place. Justified meaning made to be righteous. Now we are not righteous. We're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. But he invited us, he gave us the permission to come, and then he justified us so that we are now before God. We have the standing, the righteous standing of Christ. We are justified in the sight of God. Now, this is, I like to illustrate this by saying it's like there's this giant filing cabinet in heaven and uh, all of our sins are, you know, sort of filed away in, in a file. Mine would be the whole cabinet, you know. But it's, it's like Christ, when he died, he, he took my file and put, took all the sins out and put it in his, because his was empty, and he died for my sins and left my file empty. And the idea is that when you stand before God on Judgment Day, because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're justified. There's no sins left for you to answer for. Because Christ has already died and paid the price for them. And so that justification, though Jesus died for the world, justification is only to those who come to him by faith. That goes back to the foreknowledge, right? Because God foreknew this, he predestined everything to work that way. He gave us the invitation, the permission slips, if you will, uh, to, to, uh, to come to glory and he justified us, which was necessary. As sinners, if we entered into the new heaven and the new earth, as sinners, we'd just make it all like this heaven and this earth. Uh, it would all just be a ruined, sinful place. So he justified us. He made us just as far as our standing before God. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And that deals with sanctification. Us becoming more like Christ, more set apart from the world and glorified, meaning that it's a guarantee that one day we will have glorified bodies and be perfect with Christ. So there's the golden chain, and now we're going to get to the meat of the message, <laughs> even though that was the longest part of the message. The chain, God foreknew those who he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, those who he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. And then verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, when some people read God is for you, they think, aha, that means that no matter how dark this battle is on, on this earth, that God's on my side. And I, I, I kind of cringe at that statement because God is not on your side. God is on God's side. We need to be on his side. But with that being said, right, he's not for us in the fact that he's going to give us everything we want. Right? We already talked about that in Romans 8, 28. Instead, what this is saying is God is for you in all of these ways. Before you, he was already for you. Right? He foreknew, he predestined you to be made into the image of God. You're dealing with sin, you're dealing with temptation, but let me tell you, God is here helping and for you to accomplish your sanctification. You're living like Christ. You say, I don't think I can ever be made like, like Jesus. Nope, it's a guarantee. God's on your side. Who can stop you from becoming like Christ? Do you think even you can stop yourself from becoming like Christ if you are predestined by God, according to his foreknowledge, to be made into the image of Christ, you can't even stop it. There's no mistake that you can make that can lose this glorious gift. But because of that, shouldn't that mean that we should be living more like Christ in our daily walk? What shall we say then? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I mean, he's giving Christ all things and put all things under his feet. He will also give us all things. That's a hard verse to even read. Like, that seems too good to be true. 
But what is the new heaven and the new earth for? If not for us to worship God in. He's given that to us. That's the whole point of it. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, God's chosen ones? It is God that justifies, that justifieth. Now this is interesting. Who can, who can bring a charge against God's elect because God has already justified them? Interestingly enough, in Revelation chapter 10, uh, 12 and verse 10, it says uh, that, that Satan is thrown out. And after he's thrown out of heaven, verse 10, it says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The devil right now is in heaven and he's accusing you before God. He's saying, did you see what Luke did last night? He's, he's, saying, he's saying, did you see what Josh did this morning? Did you say what, see what Elise did when she was uh, yelling at her brothers? And, uh, you know, uh, he's, he's accusing us before God at this moment. And he's, this is day and night. He's accusing us. But verse 33 says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is all in vain that he accuses us. He brings things to lay to, our, to the charge of God's elect. And God, here in Romans chapter 8, is telling us he dismisses the charge. Sorry, that's dismissed. Next charge. No, nope, that's dismissed. Because when you bring a charge against God's elect, it doesn't count. <laughs> because they're predestined to be conformed into the image of God, they are justified. And it says, it's God who justified them. So here comes Satan to the throne of God and says to God of those that God, the judge, has justified on the basis of his son. And he says, hey, I have a charge to lay at them. They've sinned again. And God says, nope, they're justified. That doesn't matter. That charge can't be laid to their account. Now, that doesn't give us free reign to sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, Paul writes. But this does mean that our standing with God does not change when we mess up. That's a really encouraging thing. It also rules out the possibility, again, of us ever losing our salvation. Because even though our salvation is based on God's foreknowledge of whether we're going to accept him, meaning I'm not a Calvinist, I'm also not an Armenian, which believes that you can lose your salvation. Why? Because it says God justifies. When God justifies someone, that's it. That no charge can be laid to their account. There is no more sin that can be committed that can be laid to their account in heaven and mar their record uh, and take their name out of the book of life, right? Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justify, but justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? Who can condemn us? Is it not God who condemns us if we're sinners? It's not the devil who condemns us. It's not us who condemn ourselves. It's God who is the judge, and he has justified us. He's because of his foreknowledge, predestined from the beginning of time that we would be made into the image of Christ and he's justified us. You can't take that away. Who would even be the one to condemn us if God's the one justifying us? Is God going to work against himself now and condemn us? This is a glorious truth. It says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God who maketh intercession for us? Christ is making intercession for us, which is, by the way, the reason that we're justified and the reason that the charges that are brought against us are dismissed because we have an advocate. We have an enemy, but we also have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, the scripture tells us. And when the enemy comes and lays a charge, Jesus, the advocate, stands up and says, uh, uh, that doesn't count. <laughs> no, you can take that somewhere else because I've already taken care of that. He's justified because of Jesus, who is the, Jesus Christ the righteous. He makes intercession for us. Now, interestingly enough, earlier in chapter 8, 
um, Paul has al- already written that the Spirit makes intercession for us before the Father with groanings which cannot be uttered. And now here's Christ making intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now remember, put this in context, what we're about to read. Back to verse 28. All things work together for good. We think about all the darkness that we see in the world and all the difficulties that we deal with in our lives. and We see these as hindrances. Paul has already written that no, in fact, all things work together for good. And God has allowed them to work his purpose of likeness to Christ, which is the goal. And then he says, how could these things ever separate you from the love of Christ? How could they possibly be bad things? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? How could these things separate us from the love of Christ? In fact, no, they drive us to Christ because Christ suffered tribulation and distress and persecution. Uh, Jesus Christ himself on the cross suffered It even says here, he spared not his own son in verse 32, but delivered him up for us. So when we suffer persecution and pain and difficulty, aren't we more like Christ? Because that's what Christ suffered? You see how all of these things are are making us more like him. Uh, Famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yeah, we suffer, but we don't suffer for nothing. We suffer for the sake of God and for his will and his purpose. Nay, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors. It's not just that when these things come at us, we conquer them. This is kind of, (laughs) this is what I've always thought of when I thought of this verse. I'm a conqueror, but I miss the word more. It's not that when difficulty comes my way, I conquer it and come out victorious at the other end. No, I'm more than that. The difficulty itself is actually accomplishing good. Like, it's not that when I get through this tunnel, on the other side is a ray of light. No, the whole tunnel is actually accomplishing wonderfully good things. And it looks dark to me, but it actually is good. And it's, we're more than a conqueror of these difficulties, These difficulties are actually accomplishing the will of God. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And here, we, here it comes to it, the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He did foreknow us. He did foreknow that we would come to him by faith. And he does love us as children. He does love us. Just like previous in the, previously in the chapter, it says we cry, Abba, Father. We've been adopted into the family of God, guaranteed this glorious future with Christ. And it says nothing can stop it. You see, what Paul is not saying here is that we don't have to go through uh, difficulties. We don't have to deal with death or angels, or principalities, or powers. We can bind Satan, by the way, when we pray. We can say, I bind you, Satan, and we don't have to deal with Satan. No, no, no. We have to deal with all that stuff. All of that stuff is stuff we do deal with. But I'm persuaded that they cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Why? Because all the worst that the world, and the flesh, and the devil can hurl at us is either stopped by God and not allowed to continue on in our lives Or, it's allowed because God knows it's going to accomplish his purpose. And what a glorious peace that is. If God be for us, who can be against us? In in thinking about this verse in context with all the other passages we've we've studied in this messianic series on on the Messiah, 
to see that after his resurrection, death and resurrection, not only did he win the victory, but the victory is now, it's done. It's already been won. We are already guaranteed this future. And now we're just waiting for it. And while we're waiting, we're to, becoming, to be becoming more like Christ every day. And I would encourage us to, I would, I would want to encourage everyone in this way this, this afternoon. First, that we would not be discouraged in, in tough and difficult times because Christ is working something that's not necessarily ever going to be seen in this world, but we're going to find out later, all brought us closer to Christ. And second, that we would let the work of God do its work that we would allow ourselves to be made more like Christ every day. You know, from the, from the little things to the big things. Something goes wrong, you know, uh, through the day. You're at work and something, man, that really bothered you. It really frustrated you. Plagues on your mind. If you're like me, you're an overthinker. You, something small goes wrong and you think about it for 48 hours and stress over it. Instead of saying, wait a minute, God allowed that thing to happen to make me more like Christ. Let, let that suffering and tribulation have its work in you to make you more like Christ. And get out of the way. Stop praying against God and just saying, Lord, if this is what you want for me, then do your work in it, I pray. And let's have that attitude as we go through our, our week this week. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for your great blessings to us. We pray that you would help us to be more like Jesus. Thank you for the guarantee that we have that no one can lay a charge to God's elect, that no one can take away this glorious future that we have of being like Christ in the new body, in the new heaven, and the new earth. But we pray, Lord, as we wait for it, that we would be heading in that direction, becoming more like Christ in our daily walk. We pray these things in Jesus' name.